welcome to a new Getting to Know Japan webinar. Thank you so much for joining us and a big thank you to our program sponsor, the Japan Foundation New York for funding this series and enabling us to put this on each week. Today, uh, today we are joined by Dr. Sven Zoller, who will be presenting on Min and Metal, Public Statuary, and Modern Japan. Just a kind reminder to refrain from turning on your microphones during the duration of today's recording and presentation. Dr. Sven Zoller is Dean of the Graduate School of Global Studies and Professor of Modern Japanese History at Sophia University in Tokyo, as well as a member of the Steering Committee of the National Institutes for, hum for Humanities. After earning a PhD in Japanese Studies and History from Bonn University, he held positions at Marburg University, the German Institute for Japanese Studies, and the University of Tokyo. He is author of Pol Politics, Memory, and Public Opinion, and Men in Metal, a Topography of Public Bronze Statuary in Modern Japan, and the Rutledge Handbook of Modern Japanese History. Dr. Zoller, it is a pleasure to have you with us here today. I'll let you take it from here. Yeah, thank you, Amani, for the invitation and for the very kind introduction. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in tonight. Um, so um, I am a historian of Japan, as Amani just uh, mentioned, and uh, I got in recent decades interested in particular in memorials that mark historical events or in sculptures that are supposed to memorialize historical personalities. And uh, that will be the topic of tonight's uh, talk. Uh, a few years ago, I published a book uh, with the same title as today's talk, Men in Metal, which is the summary of my uh, research about this particular um, category of, of sculpture, of uh, public statuary, of historical personalities in Japan. So let me share the screen. Okay, yeah. So this is the cover of my book, by the way. I will uh, come back to this again later. Um, before we come to Japan, uh, let me uh, first uh, give you uh, make a few remarks about public statuary um, in general. Uh, public statuary is, of course, not um, a uniqueness of the politics of memory of uh, Japan. It is a common element in an, of the nation building in many modern nation states of all kinds of political couleur. You see here a number of um, statues from a number of states, from, uh, from China, from Taiwan, the Republic of China, the United States, the former Soviet Union and Imperial Germany. Um, you see here also from the variety of political systems that statuary is not just limited to, um, to authoritarian regimes, although this might uh, depend to a little bit, uh, to a certain degree on your definition of uh, authoritarian, but you do find statues and of course also other memorials in uh, a broad variety of political systems. Um, statues receive particular attention when controversies uh, about them emerge, and particularly when uh, statues are toppled, a phenomenon we could observe frequently in the last five to ten years. The controversies sometimes have to do with the size of a statue, with its design, or with its location, but most commonly controversies surrounding statues are the result of the historical background of the depicted individual and uh, the historical interpretation of that individual. In that sense, controversies about statues are closely related to developments in historiography, and uh, they represent much more than just a debate about a, a, a piece of metal stand, standing somewhere in town. Um, this is as much true for the more uh, attention gathering fall of uh, monuments as it is for the process of planning and building a statue, which is usually a much more lengthy process. And this is also the process that stands in the uh, center of attention of my book. When we uh, focus on the building of a statue uh, rather than its fall, uh, then the main question that emerges is why people uh, build statues in the first place. And this leads us to the question of what is the function of a statue? 
Um, some people might think this is self-evident. It is the representation of a certain historical personality in public space, uh, but it's actually much more complicated than that. So let me uh, give you uh, give a few remarks about the purpose of public statuary. So statuary is, of course, uh, first of all, a genre of art. Uh, public statues, however, in particular those depicting historical personalities, are usually categorized as political art. And in general, they are more political than they are art, as I will uh, explain throughout this talk. Suffice it to say at this point that their artistic value is often considered uh, dubious. And during the process of commissioning a statue, the commissioning authority is always in a charge. And it is the commissioning authority that makes the decisions, even about design, not so much the sculptor himself. This is quite nicely captured in the photograph here on the right, where you have the sculptor uh, standing at the bottom of his own work being uh, outsized and overshadowed by his own creation. The distinction between history and memory is also important in this context. Statues of historical personalities are mnemonic devices, but they are a very dubious representation or expression of history. Um, we uh, could also consider statues an example of what uh, the German philosopher Nietzsche called monumental history, because they are characterized by an extremely one-dimensional and celebratory approach to history. And thus, in open societies at least, statues constitute an obstacle to critical thinking. Lastly, we have to be aware that, the, uh, that statues are more than an expression of history and a historical personality, but they usually embody and represent a set, a set of values, and uh, they are designed to indoctrinate the public with these values. The longer a statue stands, the more doubt usually is shed on how appropriate a statue is to remain in the public eye and in public space. Uh, such doubts frequently emerge in, uh, uh, in the case of a regime change or a government change, in case of or as a result of legal revisions, as the result of new interpretations of the depicted personality or her or his historical context, or of changes in the values held in the society in question. So let me now move on to Japan. Uh, in Japan, first of all, it is important to realize that uh, statues of historical personalities are a modern phenomenon. In Japan, as in most um, other uh, countries, uh, in Japan, there were no statues of historical personalities before 1880, but after 1880, um, and until the end of World War II, more than 800 statues were built and set up in public space. Since 1945, more than 3,000 statues have been built in Japan. So today you will find over 3,000 statues of historical personalities only, not counting other uh, sculpture, public sculpture. Um, before uh, 1880, of course, there was a uh, um, religious statuary uh, in Japan, as in other, other countries, Buddhist uh, statuary, uh, first of all, uh, but no secular statuary show, showing his, uh, historical personalities. Um, these numbers, of course, uh, whether it's 800 for pre-war statuary or 3,000 for post-war statuary is far too big to make really sense out of it which is why uh, one of the unique approaches in my book is that I created a, a database to make some sense out of the uh, um, uh, out of this uh, uh, public sculpture in uh, Japan. Uh, usually research on monuments um, engages in the in-depth um, research on case studies. I've also done that. So you will also find a number of case studies in my book. But in order to find out which case studies are significant, um, it is important to look at the numbers of statues and also at the numbers of 
um, the historical personalities that are being uh, depicted here, and uh, through that come uh, to the conclu conclu conclusion of which uh, statues would be relevant for a case study. Let me present you some of the results of the quantitative analysis that I conducted. So first of all, um, as I mentioned, uh, the first statue in public space in Japan was built in 1880. Uh, until 1900, statues grew, grew only in very small numbers. But after 1900, uh, you can see that uh, until the end of World War II uh, or the escalation of uh, the Asia-Pacific War into the Pacific War, um, we see a constant, a continuous stream of uh, uh, a statue proliferation, which is sometimes um, interrupted. Uh, for example, here in the early 1930s, there are very few statues that were set up in Japan. This is a result of the world economic crisis. There was no uh, money left for building statues. Donations did not come in, and that's why very few numbers were built in those years. Then you can see the number increases again a little bit in the mid 1930s, but then goes down again. This is, of course, the result of World War II and of the national mobilization law, which actually explicitly banned sculptors from using metal for artistic purposes. On the other hand, you see that in the 1920s, we have a huge number of statues being built, which is a result of the economic affluence in the 1920s. Uh, and in some years, we see that almost every week, basically, one statue uh, on average was uh, unveiled in Japan. This boom of statue building in Japan and also in other countries since the 19th century has also to do with a certain development in historiography, namely the um, popularity of what is also called the great man view of history, which is something that today most historians would not find a appropriate um, 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 theoretical approach to history um, anymore. Although, as we will see on the next slide, it is still relatively popular. Um, this great man view of history was for the first time explicitly expressed by a historian called Thomas Carlyle, who in 1841 wrote a famous book titled On Heroes, Hero Worship, and the Heroic in History. And uh, most of you probably know this very famous line from this book that the history of the world is but the biography of great man. Um, this great man view of history was also introduced uh, to Japan in the 1870s, 80s, and 90s through translations and uh, articles on Carlyle by people such as Fukusawa, Yukichi, uh, and uh, others. Um, the first, um, ah, yeah, sorry, uh, this is the post-war part uh, of my um, um, of my uh, quantitative analysis, you see that also throughout the post-war period, we see again large numbers of statues being built uh, through, uh, uh, throughout um, Japan with some ups and downs, which uh, again we can explain mostly with uh, the economic uh, developments um, at the time, but this also indicates that even after World War II, the great man view of history remained uh, alive and kicking uh, in Japan. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll skip over this one. Um, the, ve the very first uh, discussion of uh, uh, constructing uh, statues uh, were related to the foundation of a new category of Shinto shrines in Japan after the Meiji Restoration of 1868. Um, you probably you had a lecture, I think, in your series about the Meiji period, and also probably most of you know uh, that the Meiji Restoration is considered the found, foundation, uh, foundational event of modern Japan and of the modern nation state in Japan. Um, one of the um, objectives of the new government was, uh, first of all, um, to construct some kind of idea of nationhood, and then, of course, to disseminate this feeling of nationhood among the people. Uh, 
because it was not existing. Japan before 868 was divided up in feudal domains. There was no notion, no understanding of what a nation is. Um, secondly, as one of the most important values that uh, this uh, that would categorize, um, um, sorry, characterize um, this nation, uh, the government promoted the ideal of um, loyalty to the emperor. And uh, the foundation of shrines in the early Meiji period had uh, to do very much with this idea of promoting um, loyalty um, to the emperor as an important, if not the central value of Meiji Japan and of this new ideal of nationhood. Um, for example, one of the very first shrines that was built um, uh, as a new Shinto shrine was a shrine dedicated um, to a um, warlord um, who had ruled Japan before the Tokugawa shogunate took over, namely uh, Toyotomi Hideyoshi. And he was one of the historical figures who now was venerated in this new category of newly built shrines where national heroes, forefathers of the nation, and representatives of the uh, national values that I just explained uh, were venerated and worshipped as uh, deities. Hideyoshi was um, worshipped here because he was now in the um, uh, Meiji period seen as an imperial loyalist because um, before uh, the Tokugawas, he was the ruler of Japan, but he was not shogun. He was not the supreme uh, military commander of Japan, he ruled more in uh, cooperation with the imperial court, so he was now reconstructed as what the new government would see as an imperial loyalist. And that is why one of the first of these shrines um, dedicated to historical personalities in the first years of Meiji was dedicated to Toyotomi Hideyoshi, namely the Hokoku Shrine in Osaka. Osaka Castle had been one of the strongholds of uh, Toyotomi Hideyoshi. The statue that you see here was built much later, um, actually. Um, but um, the important point here is that these shrines, which were built in the late 1860s and early 1870s, um, inquired to the government whether they would be allowed to um, to set up statues um, to um, um, signify, to symbolize the person they were venerating. As I just said, in this particular shrine, which was one of the first shrines that was built, the statue was built much later, uh, but we have some documents in which the government discusses this question and uh, eventually comes to the conclusion that the building of monuments would be adequate in these Shinto shrines, although the government um, uses the katakana term monument. So those of you who can read uh, katakana here can see monumento. They use this Western term monument. They're highly aware that this is a Western custom, but they tell the newly found shrines, yes, it's okay to set up monuments of the person that you worship in your shrine. Um, the very first statue that eventually was built um, in Japan, however, was set up in a public park, which until today is one of the common sites uh, where you can find statues. So if you go to a local park, you often will find a statue of a historical personality. And the first one was set up in the city of Kanasawa in 1880 in a famous park called uh, Kendokuen. The statue shows a uh, ancient warrior called Yamato Takeru. And now some of you, maybe some of you have read uh, the famous book by Ivan Morris, The Nobility of Failure. Actually, the first chapter in that book is on Yamato Takeru. And uh, although the book is supposed to be a book on history, um, we are not even sure whether this person even existed. <laughs> Yamato Takeru is one of the figures who comes up in the, uh, uh, in the Japanese mythology, in the imperial mythology. And he was supposed to be the son of an emperor who um, went to the periphery of what was Japan at the time and uh, subdued uh, unruly tribes. Um, as you can see, he, uh, the sculpture shows him here with a sword in hand. And uh, all of this is rather important because one of the reasons the statue of his was put up here 
is that uh, this was a way through which the central government tried to disseminate an image of the imperial house as uh, uh, having a, a military function, as having the supreme command of the military. Um, as you, of course, all know, uh, the imperial court had no military function for centuries before the Meiji Restoration, right? Because Japan had a very powerful military aristocracy, the samurai and the feudal lords, the daimyo, they had the say in military affairs and the imperial court since at least the 14th century had been entirely demilitarized. So in 1870 or so, claiming that the emperor is the supreme commander of the military forces of Japan was entirely beyond uh, uh, comprehension for most uh, Japanese because the imperial court had no military function whatsoever for centuries. So actually the people in Kanazawa wanted to build a statue of Meiji Tenno, of Meiji Emperor, and present him as uh, the supreme commander of the military. However, that plan was rejected. Um, so this uh, figure of Yamato Takeru was um, um, set up. Uh, statues of Meiji Emperor were actually proposed uh, sometimes in pre-war Japan, but were eventually not built um, and uh, were only built at a much later point. Uh, I'm running out of time, so I have to skip this. Um, so rather than Meiji Emperor, we have other figures from Japanese mythology and early imperial figures being set up here, including Yamato Takeru, but also Keitai Emperor. This is a very early statue in Fukui. And Jimu Tenno, the definitely legendary founder of Japan, according to the Japanese mythology, of whom several sculptures were set up in the 1890s and 1900s. Um, the reason Yamato Takeru was uh, chosen here as a symbol of the military um, was also that he had um, allegedly, according to the mythology, fought some battles in the south of Japan in, in, in Kyushu. And uh, 1880 um, is just three years of what is known as the Satsuma Rebellion, a rebellion of, of uh, um, samurai in what is today Kagoshima Prefecture against the central government. And the central government sent troops to Kagoshima and to Kyushu to sub suppress um, this uh, rebellion. And this included troops from Kanazawa. And 400 of these soldiers died in this, uh, uh, in, in what is called in Japanese the Southwest War, because it was more than a rebellion, it was a civil war, basically. And uh, when the surviving troops returned uh, to Kanazawa, the uh, former feudal lord of the feudal domain here actually set up a memorial stone uh, in one of those recently found uh, shrines to commemorate the 400 soldiers. Uh, basically, these were samurai. These were not conscripts yet. Um, who died in the suppression of this samurai rebellion. Um, however, the uh, central government represented in Kanazawa by the governor, a Mr. Chisaka, um, insisted that this uh, memorial was not enough and also it was standing in the shrine, so he insisted on a statue being set up in uh, the park, uh, and this was the statue to uh, uh, dedicated to Yamato Takedo. So this was the very first uh, statuary um, in Japan. What is also interesting, you see, apart from um, today, this round memorial, which was initially set up in the park, also stands next to the statue. And there are also other inscriptions here, which pass a very harsh judgment of the leader of this Satsuma rebellion, namely a Mr. Saigo Takamori, who is described here as a perfidious uh, rebel and a traitor uh, who is responsible for the deaths of those 400 soldiers. Uh, those of you who might have been to Ueno Park might know um, that there is a statute uh, until today uh, dedicated to Saigo Takamori, and he is one of the famous national heroes today. Um, he is also the prototype uh, for, he was the prototype for this movie, The Last Samurai. Um, of course, here on the film poster, 
This is not Tom Cruise. This is Watanabe Ken, because some people misunderstood the movie. The Last Samurai was not Tom Cruise, but uh, um, um, this gentleman, which is supposed to be Saigo Takamori. So today he has a very positive image um, in Japan, uh, but not in this inscription that you see here in uh, Kanazawa. Um, I'll skip this um, and uh, want to talk uh, at the end a little bit about uh, the visibility of statues. Sometimes people doubt how effective a statuary is. And of course, first of all, we have to think about different media approaches in the 19th century and today. Um, but uh, um, statues usually, and that's another result of my uh, um, quantitative analysis, it's not super... <laughs> Um, surprising so, of course, um, but most of the statues stand in public parks and, uh, of course, people go to public parks and they notice um, statues here, but beyond uh, the place where statues stand, we have uh, statues constantly being reproduced uh, in the print media. Uh, this goes from lithography here on the left, uh, uh, no, Whitblock prints on the left to lithography in the middle to advertisement, what you see on the right is uh, advertisement for uh, tobacco. And you see again, Mr. Uh, Saigo Takamori being used here in a very positive way for advertisement. Uh, we see uh, statues on the currency, on cover, on the on cover of journals, um, and even on, uh, um, on the cover of the white book of uh, defense of Japan in 2021. Uh, exactly one year after my book uh, came out. Um, I just leave that uncommended here. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I have to skip over several slides here, I'm afraid. Um, yeah, um, my title has, uh, my book has the title Men in Metal, uh, just um, um, to uh, uh, note here. I do have a chapter on uh, uh, women uh, who are uh, depicted in statuary. There are some, but as you can see from this result of my quantitative analysis, there are very few, about 5%. And Japan, again, is no um, exception in that uh, respect. 5% um, uh, is, is pretty much the average um, in case of the United States. I found a uh, analysis, it's about 8%. So Japan is not particularly uh, bad in that respect. Um, because um, you are located in uh, Yokosuka, which of course has um, a very heavy uh, Navy background. There are also a number of statues that portray uh, naval heroes. Um, this one is a post-war statue of Admiral Togo, probably the most uh, uh, famous uh, Japanese naval hero, the most important pre-war statues dedicated to naval uh, commanders were Commander Hattori. This was a statue that was built in the 1800s, uh, 1890s um, in uh, Sasebo. And the most famous um, st uh, Navy related statue built in Tokyo of Commander Hirose Takeo, who was a commander in the Russo Japanese War, who died here allegedly trying to save a, a fellow officer. And with this, I think I have to come uh, to my conclusion, or at least uh, let me close with one of the conclusions that I offer in my book to explain uh, the usage of uh, statuary in the politics of memory and in the politics of indoctrination, the population with national values in modern Japan, but also in other states. Um, Basically, statues neatly exemplify uh, the religious character of uh, uh, nationalism. We, in, in social sciences, we, we have this concept of a civic religion, of nationalism being a civic religion. And I think uh, statues um, embody this concept uh, very well. Um, statues have a strongly religious or offer uh, a strongly religious iconography of founders, saints, and martyrs. Um, as you saw on one of the slides that I had to skip before, uh, sometimes people organize pilgrimage, pilgrimages to the sites of worship. I had a photo before uh, where uh, children, school children, were taken to the statue of a hero, and then they had to polish um, the statue as a patriotic service. 
um, statues are usually, um, um, it is a taboo to criticize or scrutinize the statue or the hero who is depicted um, in a statue. This can even be a uh, less majesty uh, in a more uh, legal and narrow sense. I acts of iconoclasm are often outlawed and heretics are marginalized. And that, of course, includes critical historians who nowadays more and more uh, question uh, the legitimacy of statues from the 19th century standing in 21st century cityscapes and landscapes. Um, lastly, because there are also some listeners, uh, participants from the US, I guess, um, we, we saw this very well in the United States in 2020, when uh, actually quite a number of statues were um, toppled, not, not too many actually, um, uh, you might have the image that 90% of statuary in the US or other countries was toppled, it was actually more like 2 or 3% while 97, 98% are still standing. Still, uh, President Trump uh, saw the need to issue an executive order uh, on protecting American memo monuments, memorials and statues and combating recent criminal violence. Uh, I mean, criminal violence, as it, as it's quite evident, right? I mean, criminal violence is illegal, of course, uh, to begin with, even without an executive order. Um, also, the vandalizing and toppling of statues is illegal, although it's not a particularly um, terrible act in terms of um, 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 in, in terms of protection of cultural properties, because most of these statues are not particularly old and they are usually not considered particularly valuable in terms of art um, as, as uh, uh, products of art. Um, however, what we see here very nicely is the outlawing and, and also the marginalization of critical voices, those who are against statues in this executive order where um, called um, left-wing extremists, although I think they were not all left-wing extremists. They are um, 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 they are judged to uh, to uh, uh, aim at the destruction of the United States system of government, which is kind of ironic in retrospective, I guess. And uh, they are uh, uh, said to advance a fringe ideology. So we can see here the marginalization of critical voices of statuary in public space. Um, yeah, I will leave it um, to this. So again, this is my book. Thank you for uh, listening. And um, if you look here at the yellow marked uh, link, uh, this book is actually open um, access. Uh, so you can download uh, the chapters, uh, I think only one by one if you access um this um this link basically you just need to remember the number uh 39541 and then you can easily find it and download the book uh freely okay thank you for listening uh, and yeah i think i have to finish here okay <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Zoller, for that awesome presentation. Um, I'm so sorry that we weren't able to get to all aspects of your presentation because it looked very interesting in the slides that you passed up. But um, to begin with the Q&A portion, um, I'm curious. So you mentioned about various statues, so mostly related to like um, history, um, you know, um, military heroes. Um, but one statue that comes to mind, and I'm pretty sure this is a very common statue in which a lot of um, foreigners, in particular tourists, get, get the chance to see in person is like Hachiko in, in Shibuya. So I'm yeah. curious, how do we get from, you know, these military statues, these historical statues to Hachiko? <laughs> Thank you. That, that's a question I often get. Um, but so well, the book is only about historical personality. So, um, I mean, Hachiko is a historical dog. Um, so initially, I, I wasn't sure whether to leave him out. Uh, a colleague of mine has written a very nice article about Hachiko and why the statue was built and what it signifies. So that made my decision easier to leave uh, not only Hachiko, but also other animals um, out of uh, my uh, book. Um, so you, you can, if, if, if you Google this, 
um, you can find a nice article about Hachiko. So the, com the, the combining element here uh, would be that Hachiko, of course, also signifies and exemplifies a certain value, namely loyalty. So here it is taken to an entirely new level, right? So the um, um, the nationalism of modern Japan, or of pre-war Japan in particular, um, expected from the Japanese loyalty um, to the nation and to the emperor in particular, to such a degree that they, of course, would sacrifice their lives in war. That was a very um, quite explicit um, objective of statue building. That was a recurrent theme that you find quite often in a prospectus or a report uh, about statue building, of which there are quite a few. And um, here we have, of course, um, um, a very similar situation with Hachiko, that this was a dog who would loyally wait for uh, the owner, uh, even though one day he would not uh, return. So it was uh, exemplifying the value of loyalty. And of course, if a dog is so loyal, then human beings, of course, have to be even better at it, right? Uh, I think that is the message that is underlying uh, this statue. Yeah. Mm. Thank you so much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I also wanted to ask, um, so today, like in, in the 21st century, you know, in today's time, I guess, in the present, mm. what kind of statues are being made currently? Are, are we still seeing a continuation of these kind of similar statues, like, you know, from in history or perhaps from the, you know, the Asian Pacific War, or are we seeing some you know, different types of statues, like perhaps more yeah. political statues in, in reference to, you know, uh, maybe some politicians today that, that we're familiar with. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it, it's kind of interesting that um, very few statues overall show um, people who were born after the war or even during the war. So one focus of statue, I mean, yeah, so statue building is still going on <laughs> to start with that. Um, and uh, it, it is always a little bit of a fashion uh, uh, related to historical anniversaries. So for example, in 2018, there was the 150th anniversary of the major restoration. And some cities planned uh, statues of heroes from the major restoration. Actually, very few of those pr uh, projects eventually materialized, indicating that people are losing interest in the Meiji restoration. We could also conclude that from other um, um, events uh, that were or were not held. <laughs> Uh, uh, at the time, uh, but, but a couple of them were, were built. So there are still some cities uh, or towns or villages that build statues um, um, of heroes, quote unquote, <laughs> related to the history of the major restoration. Um, but a new uh, development after World War II and in more recent years also is a statue of um, athletes. Um, so that was something that we hardly had before the war and even until the 1960s. So we have statues of famous uh, sumo uh, ringers or of uh, Olympic gold medal winners uh, in swimming or in marathon, some people who are still very much alive and kicking. Uh, very, very, yeah, people were still quite young, actually. Um, so that's a new category that has been coming up. And, and also some entertainers. There are some statues of, of TV celebrities. Um, and it is not themselves, I suppose, who built those statues, but the fan community as the same um, um, with the athletes. Um, so that would be a new category. And these also would be younger persons who would not be born before the war, but uh, uh, more recent personalities. Yeah. So these would be, uh, uh, um, yeah, some more recent uh, developments, I guess. Yeah. Mm. With the mention of fans, it makes me think, I, I wonder in the future if we'll start seeing like J-pop idols with statues mm. being supported by their fans. It's, yeah, yeah, it's 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 possible, of course. Yeah, mm -hmm. I would have to look up, but at least at least one TV celebrity singer, Vada Akiko. There's there's a statue of hers. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Mm. Um, so moving on to questions in the chat, Patricia Yaro asked, um, "I have always wondered about the dog in the Psycho statue in Wino Cohen. Um, yeah. What is its significance? Um, 
other than providing an ah, oh, how adorable element. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, wow, that's a long and complicated story, which I have in the book, but uh, maybe to, to, to keep it short. So um, Saigo Takamori, I, I shortly referred to him, was this guy um, who played a very important role in the Meiji Restoration, which is why he is still considered a major national hero related to this foundational event of modern Japan. However, in 1877, he was one of the leaders of the Satsuma Rebellion, about which I talked, um, which ended with him being disgraced. So his rebellion was about uh, was against the government, and at the time this was the imperial government. So strictly speaking, he was rebelling against the emperor, which is of course not how he saw it, but the the government did, and the government troops won. So he was declared an enemy of the court and a rebel and a traitor after this suppression uh, after this rebellion was suppressed. He was pardoned in 1890, um, as many other people as well, because of the Meiji constitution. This led to the pardoning of many former so-called enemies of the court. But he was still an ambiguous figure. So um, when after the pardon, uh, his former compatriots from his uh, feudal domain uh, suggested a bit of statue for him, they wanted to build an equestrian statue. And at the time, there were no equestrian statues in Japan. So um, the government, which had to approve of such plans to build statues, said, yeah, you can have a statue, but not an equestrian one. And also, you need to build it in Ueno Park and not in front of the Imperial Palace, um, which um, uh, the original plan uh, uh, was. So. Um, Originally, an equestrian statue was uh, planned, which meant a, a sculptor was already asked to build the horse, to, to cast the horse. And now this sculptor suddenly became unemployed, so to say. Um, and uh, that's why those who planned the statue said, OK, then let's give Saigo a dog, because for one, this will make the sculptor happy. And secondly, it also will give Saigo a more peaceful image. So he looks now in, uh, um, in, in a yukata, he looks very peaceful, he's going for a walk with his dog, and that does not uh, transmit the image of a rebel, right, of the leader of an armed rebellion, a, a guy who caused a civil war that cost uh, uh, several thousand lives. So that was behind the change of design. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, the next question comes from Jeff. Who was making these statues in the, 1800, uh, the 1880s uh, when they started uh, beginning in development? What about these days? Is there a first statue that was made public for public spaces that we know? Um, if so, what was it? Uh, so the very first statue is what you're asking. Yeah, yeah, that was the statue I, I introduced, uh, the Yamato Takeru statue in Kendoko and Park in Kanasawa City. Um, and that was basically um, um, proposed by the representatives of the new central state in Kanazawa. Uh, the governor, whom I mentioned, but also the imperial army stationed in uh, Kanazawa. And, and the reason was um, that at the time, as I explained, uh, there was still no feeling of nationhood. Uh, the people felt still as much linked to their feudal identities, to their feudal domain, to their feudal lord, uh, as they did to the Tokyo government. Um, and they considered the Tokyo government, they had no, no idea of nationhood, no, no sense of patriotism, etc. cetera. Um, and uh, this first statue was explicitly built uh, to, to deepen that um, affection to this newly uh, produced um, um, concept of the nation. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, the next question comes from Erling Ogoy. Um, you briefly skimmed through the, a slide showing uh, which personages are most frequently made statues yeah. of. Um, could you show that slide again, please? Yeah, if that's okay, I can do that. Um, can at the same time mention, uh, first of all, one a characteristic of, of this part of the quantitative analysis. So as I said today, we have 3000 statues in Japan but the largest number of one person uh, being depicted in statues is about three dozen. 
so that means that the um The public study of Japan is quite unique in a sense that it's very diverse. So we have not one figure dominating the public statuary. This is the case, for example, in uh, authoritarian states uh, such as uh, uh, communist China. Not anymore so today, but initially you had uh, hundreds of uh, statues of Mao Zedong. Uh, or the Soviet Union, where you had thousands of statues of Lenin and later also Stalin. Um, but also some other figures. Uh, but in Japan, we do not have one dominant figure. So that's quite interesting here. Um, the figures that um, you will find statues most frequently nowadays um, are all post-war, namely Matsu Obasho, a, a poet, and Noguchi Hideo, a doctor. And all of these statues are post-war, and they represent Japan's post-war identity, namely Japan's identity as a peace state, a cultural state, and a scientific state. So um, culture in uh, uh, in form of Matsuo as a poet, and science in form of uh, Noguchi Hideo. Then you have uh, the, 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 uh, the, the statues marked yellow, the persons marked yellow. These would be imperial house figures. So you still see even today um, representatives of the imperial house, uh, emperors, former emperors, um, um, are still quite important in public space. Um, and then you have uh, marked blue uh, figures related to the history of the Meiji Restoration or the Meiji State, such as Saigo Takamori, uh, but also uh, Sakamoto Ryoma. And the red people are former um, um, warlords, uh, warrior daimyos. Not samurai, but high-ranking feudal lords and warrior chiefs. And these would be built, uh, as I, I mentioned, uh, for the case of Toyotomi Hideyoshi, uh, as a reminder of the value of loyalty to the emperor. And to kind of, um, I guess, refer to the one of the slides that you passed up, the majority of, I think, on the graph you had, the majority of statues we can find today are of samurai? Um, yes, uh, and I, I skipped that because it requires some additional <laughs> uh, explanation. It is samurai, but it is mostly the samurai that have to do with the Meiji Restoration. So um, I also had the, the year of birth of the people who are depicted in statues. Should come right here. Excuse me. So here you have, yeah, Samurai is the largest. And I categorized um, the statues and, and the figures they depict. Um, so some of the figures have two or three categories. So some of the figures were Samurai in, say, 1820. But then in the Meiji period, they would become politicians or even um, military officers. And why do I know that? <laughs> that would be the next slide. Namely, 50% of all statues, of all people depicted in a statue, were born in the Edo period. And again, half of those, meaning 25% of the people depicted in a statue, would be born only in the two decades from 1820 to 1839, which means these are the people who are in charge at the time of the Meiji Restoration. Thank you so much. Yeah. The next question comes from uh, Philip Dober Doberful. Um, what's the line between historical and mythological? Uh, so Emperor Jimu uh, yeah. appears to make the list as historical, but how about religious figures? Yeah. Um, so the mythological figures, I, I tried to exclude them actually uh, initially, but then I realized that in the Meiji period, these were historical figures. So of course, we don't believe in the sun goddess Amaterasu sending her great, great grandson, I think, uh, to earth to found the Japanese empire and then becoming Jimu Tenno. Uh, we, of course, nobody in Japan, I think, believes that this is history. Um, the problem is that at least in the Meiji period and until 1945, everybody did uh, or everybody had to. Uh, and of course, we also know that historians debated this. So historians were like 
yeah, we know this is not history, um, but as long as, as far as historical education is concerned, we're going to go along with it. So historians did not challenge the state um, in selling these figures as historical figures. Uh, and that's why I included them eventually in the analysis, although they are strictly speaking, indeed, not historical figures. Um, religious figures, um, of course, um, are included uh, to a certain degree. I explained that in the book. I don't want to go much, too much into the details, um, but um, um, they are included as, uh, as long as they are historical figures. So, for example, the famous Japanese priest Nichiren, um, he is the founder of a, of a spe specific school uh, of Buddhism in uh, 13th century uh, Japan. Um, and he became a figure um, that the nationalist movement in the 19th and probably the 20th century very much valued. So he is set up in some instances as a, not necessarily as a um, religious figure, as a religious statue, but as a statue referring to uh, Japan's uh, 13th, 14th century history. And in as much I, I included those statues in uh, my analysis. And there is actually one chapter about a very specific Nichiren statue, which stands in Fukuoka. Thank you very much. Hmm. Uh, the next question comes from Nadia Elbarai Yamamura. The title Men in Metal uh, for the statues, uh, what type of metal was used? Also, some of the statues you showed were white. Um, is it marble or what stone? Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the question. I yeah couldn't include that in my 30 minutes. So um, yeah, um, again, just with the men, uh, as I said, 5% of the statues represent women. Uh, and not all statues are metal, but from the very beginning uh, uh, in Japan, uh, sculptors, artists, and also the commissioning authorities made it very clear that they want uh, uh, statues, uh, 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 basically it's Bronx, it's always Bronx, which again, strictly speaking, is not a metal, it's an alloy <laughs> um, uh, made of copper and zinc and sometimes some other uh, ingredients. Um, but uh, yeah, most of them are made of uh, bronze. There are a number of stone statues uh, and even a number of statues made of cement. Uh, and that's also something I explain in the book. Um, these were made in very specific situations. For example, uh, during World War II, when it was forbidden to use metal for artistic purposes, so Japan's sculptor said, so what are we going to do now? And they used stone. Um, however, for example, marble statues are very rare in Japan. Uh, for example, in Europe, um, also in other countries, you can often find marble statues. You hardly find those in Japan. And those who are made of stone have this very sp special background. So that's why I decided that the title is OK, although only to 95% or 97 true. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, the next question comes from Philip Doberfull. Um, speaking of uh, the Babe Ruth statue, I think that was mentioned in the chat, um, how many or what percent of statues in Japan are of foreigners? Uh, right. William Clark in Sapporo is another example of what of that that comes to mind. Yeah, yeah thank you. Yeah, I think the colleague already wrote to me. Um, yeah, so um, different from the statues of athletes, as I said before, this is a more recent uh, phenomenon, but statues of foreigners were built to a relatively uh, high uh, percentage, uh, even in the Meiji uh, period. Uh, mainly foreigners who, act, who had been in Japan and had worked for the Japanese uh, government. There was this category of what is called Oyatoi Gaikokujin, the the uh, employed foreigners uh, employed by the Japanese com uh, government, sometimes also uh, companies uh, and even the military. So there is one example of a very uh, popular uh, a German um, general um, who came to Japan and taught at the military academy and he became very popular in Japan until the end of World War II, the Japanese army often, very often, uh, referred to the teachings of this uh, General Meckel, that was his name. And uh, so in, in the 1910s, at the end of the Meiji period, um, there 
um, um, at the end of the Meiji period, they uh, built a statue dedicated showing uh, uh, an effigy of General Meckel in the in the uh, building in front of the building of the general staff of the Japanese army. And so there were some other scholars, um, mostly it was scholars uh, and uh, military advisors to whom the Japanese were uh, wanted to ex uh, express their appreciation. Very famous also in Hokkaido, uh, um, the American advisor Clark. Um, yes, I think that's probably the most famous statue of a foreigner in Japan. Mm. Thank you so much. So we have two questions left. Um, so the next question comes from uh, Max Warwick. Um, my question follows uh, Amani's. Are are these statue? Are there statues of political figure per, political figures perceived as better embodying post war Japan, um, like Shirehara Kijuro, uh, Yoshida Shigeru, or Sato e Isaku? Uh, or is it a time period of statue commissioners uh, seem keen to avoid? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a very good question. I I would have to check my database, but I don't think there's a statue uh, dedicated to Shidehara, who was a pre-war foreign minister and a immediate post-war prime minister. Uh, in my humble opinion, he would be a, a great subject for a statue, but I don't think there is one for him. There is one for Yoshida Shigeru, who was prime minister for a longer period of time, and he also had very close relations to the imperial court. So that might be a reason why there is actually a statue of his just next to the imperial palace in the uh, in the um, outside garden, which is accessible, so you can go there and visit his statue. It's close to Budokan, the um, um, the concert and martial arts hall. Um, but um, yeah, um, um, some of these, I mean, post-war politicians, uh, there are some statues of post-war politicians which were usually initiated, also paid for by uh, the group of politicians that this uh, person would have been, um, 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 uh, how do you say, um, um, educated and formed. Um, so for example, there, there, there are some, um, I'm not sure about Sato Esaku, but there are some, there are statues of Tanaka Kakue, uh, for example, there are some statues of post-war prime minister, uh, prime ministers, but there are not too uh, many. So the post-war statue would be more uh, an expression of this uh, self-understanding of Japan as a cultural state and um, a peace state. But um, yeah, I mean, Shirehara Kijuro would be the prime example, but I don't think there is a statue of this. But I can check it up if you want to know. And if, if you want to contact me, please feel free to do so. Thank you so much. Um, and the final question comes from Hu Huan Tran. Um, how are these statues protected from factors such as natural disasters, like earthquakes, tsunamis, rain, and human action? Um, yeah, hardly at all, uh, because first of all, they are not considered um, something like important cultural treasures or so. They are not protected by any. Um, there are some exceptions to the statue I mentioned today, um, Yamato Takedo in Kanasawa. This is important uh, cultural treasure on the prefectural level, I think, not national designated designation. Um, but in, in general, uh, they just stand in parks, they are easily accessible, so uh, there, there have been incidents of vandalism, uh, there have also been uh, incidents of statues being toppled, um, not in post-war Japan, I think, but in pre-war Japan, uh, when political discussions were a little bit more alive, I think, than in our days. <laughs> And um, yeah, some of them have suffered massively uh, from uh, the elements, uh, of course. Uh, for example, the oldest statue, which I just uh, uh, introduced uh, of Yamato Takedo in Kanazawa, in the late 1990s or early 2000s was taken down from its uh, pedestal for restoration. And that's a great story, which I also have uh, in my book, because uh, when they took it down, they for the first time analyzed what the metal actually was, because this particular statue um, was, um, um, uh, was being damaged by the weather, but not by what you often have on statues, namely birds and birds doing their thing, right? If they sit on the, on the head of the statue. Um, no bird ever did this to Yamato Takeru in, in Kanazawa. And the result was found out when they took it down and then analyzed 
the alloy because uh, the alloy was copper and zinc and arsenic for some reason. And the birds obviously realized this is not a healthy statue. We should avoid it. Uh, and actually, the, um, uh, the, 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 the researcher who found out ha uh, how the metal was composed received for the, an article he wrote the Ig Nobel Prize. Maybe some of you know the Ig Nobel Prize, right? It's kind of a Nobel Prize for funny stuff that people can laugh about. And uh, obviously, I mean, it's not a super uh, 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 massive um, uh, 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 in, uh, finding, but it's kind of funny, right, to find out that one statue is not being <clears throat> upon by uh, birds, by pigeons, and why. So, yeah, this resulted in a researcher of Kanasawa University getting the Ig Nobel Prize. Thank you so much. That's a very, I think, an interesting way to close out our Q&A portion. <laughs> um, so, uh, thank you, Dr. Zoller, for your time today. Yeah, thank you for having me. Mm. It was a pleasure, and I think our audience really enjoyed it. Um, yeah. And uh, in addition to that, everyone, I hope that you will take a look at Dr. Zoller's book, download it and support it, and um, share it with your friends. Um, I think it, this content is is worth sharing, and, and even though we could only get 30 minutes of it, I hope um, through his his book, everyone can get some, some more answers. And of course, um, uh, uh, Dr. Zoller said, um, contact him if you have other questions. Yeah, please, mm, anytime. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um, so in addition, I want to say thank you to our program sponsor, um, the Japan Foundation New York. Um, this is our final webinar that is sponsored by the Japan Foundation New York. Um, from next month, our program will go unfunded, but I just want to say thank you to them for um, funding our series for the last year. It's been a pleasure to bring to you all um, different speakers on different topics every week, and that was made possible by the Japan Foundation New York. So I just want to say thank you for that. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll move on to our upcoming events. So currently on the screen, as you can see, is our YCAPS Giving Fund, as I mentioned from next month, our series will go unfunded. So if you would like to support us and help to bring our series back to a, a weekly series, um, we need your help. And um, every donation uh, helps in this effort. So um, yes, uh, the link on the, the screen is the PayPal link. I will put that in the chat as well. Um, if you would like to donate to us, everything helps. And we hope again in the future to bring our um, program back to a uh, more weekly series. But for now, it will be monthly. So we hope you'll join us every month for a webinar. So finally, like I said, I, I just want to say thank you to everyone who's continuously um, joined us every week while we were a weekly series. It's been a pleasure to um, talk with you all and interact with you all. Um, thank you so much again, Dr. Zoller, for being our final speaker um, uh, yeah. with regards to this uh, series, uh, the weekly series, um, and we hope that you'll join us again um, from next month. And Jeff, thank you so much for your support. Jeff and Gabby have been um, very supportive in back of moderating for me for this year, so I just want to say thank you to both of them. Gabby was here last week. Jeff um, is here this week. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. I couldn't do this without your support. Um, and everyone, like I said, thank you so much. I hope that you'll join us next month for our uh, for our webinar on uh, Wings for the Rising Sun. That's going to be exciting as well. All right. So <laughs> enough talking from me. I just want to say thank you, everyone. And I hope to see you all next month. Thank you again, Dr. Zoller, for your time. And um, take care, everyone. Thank you. Bye.